We will now deal with the issues surrounding breach of contract. We will first consider what it means to breach a contract. We will then explore what it means for a breach to be material. Finally, we will explore how the law imposes certain constructive conditions on issues surrounding a breach of contract. It is important to point out at the outset that a constructive condition operates in a very different way from an express condition, which we explored in the last module. So let's begin with breach, which is defined in section 235 of the restatement. A contract contains a set of mutual promises, performance obligations to which each party commits itself in exchange for the performance obligations of the other party. Subpart 1 of section 235 states that when a party has fully performed such a performance obligation, that party's duty is discharged. In contrast, Subpart 2 states that when a party fails to perform such an obligation, the non-performance is known as a breach. In other words, a breach is a failure to honor a contractual promise when the time for performance of that promise comes due. Breaching a contract allows the non-breaching party to sue for damages that resulted from the breach. But not all breaches are equal. Some breaches impair the value of the contract to the non-breaching party to a much greater extent than do other breaches. Accordingly, depending on its severity, contract law allows different responses to a breach from the non-breaching party. The most severe breaches are material breaches. A material breach undermines the very value of the contract to the non-breaching party and disappoints the underlying expectations that led that party to enter into the contract in the first place. As we shall see, determining whether a breach is material considers not only the loss incurred by the non-breaching party, but possible forfeiture to the breaching party if the contract is terminated as a result of the breach. In effect, the restatement creates three categories of breaches. 1. Breaches that are not material. 2. Breaches that are material, but not total. And finally, 3. Breaches that are material and total. Let's explore these categories. If a party fails to fulfill a contractual promise, no matter how insignificant, that party has breached the contract. The non-breaching party can seek damages for any loss resulting from the other party's breach. But in general, the non-breaching party is not relieved of its future performance obligations under the contract. In the case of minor breaches, that party must continue to perform its contractual duties. When a breach is more serious, however, that is, when the breach is determined to be material, the non-breaching party is permitted to take additional steps in response. Not only can that party seek damages for any loss resulting from the breach, but it can also suspend its further performance obligations under the contract and wait for the breaching party to cure the breach. This is where constructive conditions enter the picture. Section 237 of the Restatement of Contracts sets forth one of the most important constructive conditions in contract law. That section reads as follows. This section creates a constructive condition to the effect that, in a bilateral contract, each party's future performance obligation is contingent on there being no uncured material breaches of the other party. In other words, if one party materially breaches a contract, the non-breaching party's further performance obligations are suspended. If the breach is not cured or otherwise ex excused, then that party will be considered to have totally breached the contract and the non-breaching party can terminate the contract and walk away. Accordingly, for purposes of section 237, the critical issue is when a breach is considered to be material. This issue is addressed in section 241 of the restatement. Subpart A embodies the concept of materiality that we have already explored in considering the doctrines of mistake and misrepresentation. A breach of a promise is material if that breach affects the heart of the bargain. If the failure undermines the non-breaching parties achieving the very purposes and expectations that induced that party to enter into the contract in the first place. Subpart B suggests that if simple monetary damages can compensate the other party for the breach that occurred, 
that failure is less likely to be considered material. Subpart C balances the loss to the non-breaching party resulting from the failure compared to the forfeiture the breaching party will suffer if the non-breaching party is allowed to walk away from the contract. Subpart D says that a breach is less likely to be deemed material if, under the circumstances, it appears that the other party is likely to cure the failure. Finally, in determining whether a breach is material, subpart E takes account of whether the actions and assurances of the breaching party comport with standards of good faith and fair dealing. This provision is directly applicable to the Sackett v. Spindler case in our textbook, where the breaching party kept giving empty assurances that he intended to cure his failure to close on the deal to purchase the newspaper. If one party materially breaches a contract and can no longer cure the breach, then the non-breaching party is not only relieved of future performance obligations, it also can terminate the contract and sue for its entire monetary loss, including expectation damages. Section 242 of the Restatement sets forth circumstances relevant to determining when there has been a total breach, such that the non-breaching party can walk away from the contract. In addition to considering the factors related to when a breach is material, the section in effect looks to whether a further delay in not terminating the contract will prejudice the non-party in finding substitute arrangements. Let's now consider the issue of substantial performance, a concept closely associated with the Jacob and Young's case. In effect, to determine that a party has substantially performed its contractual duties is the equivalent of determining the party has not materially breached the contract. In concluding that there has been substantial performance and no material breach is the equivalent of concluding that there is no failure of the constructive condition set out in section 237. This is not the same as determining that there has been no breach. It is merely to conclude that whatever breach has occurred, it is not material, that is, not serious enough to justify the non-breaching party suspending its future performance obligations. At most, that non-breaching party can seek monetary damages for the other party's failures. As we learned in the Oppenheimer case, the doctrine of substantial performance has no applicability to express conditions. In effect, the law is more flexible and forgiving in excusing constructive conditions than in excusing express conditions. This is because express conditions are agreed to by the parties themselves, while constructive conditions are imposed on the parties by the law. Accordingly, if a contract contains an express condition, it must be satisfied exactly. There's little room for excusing the non-occurrence of that condition. In contrast, a constructive condition can be satisfied by substantial, though imperfect, performance. Let's now consider two hypotheticals that raise the issues discussed in this module. In the first hypothetical, the owner enters into an agreement with a contractor to build a house. The arrangement consists of various documents entitled construction agreement, plans, and specifications. One of the many specs requires that in painting the walls on the main floor, the contractor is to use Ecru Supreme colored Benjamin Moore paint. This spec is a promise, a duty the contractor has undertaken to perform pursuant to the agreement. Near the completion of the project, the owner discovers that the contractor has used an inferior brand of paint and the color doesn't match the swatch of Ecru Supreme. In failing to fulfill its promise, the contractor has breached the contract. At a minimum, the owner is entitled to monetary damages to compensate for the breach. But does the owner have other options? More particularly, is the owner entitled to terminate the contract direct the contractor to stop his work and hire someone else to finish the construction? In all likelihood, a court would not consider the contractor's breach to be material under Section 241. To begin with, it's doubtful that paint type and color are a central purpose of a home construction project. Moreover, it's easy to compensate for that breach by allowing the owner to hire another painter to repaint the walls and then sue the contractor for reimbursement. Because the breach is not material, the owner will not be permitted to, to suspend its future payment obligation, nor will he be permitted to terminate the contract. Now let's consider a second hypothetical. Assume that near the end of the construction project, the owner discovers that the contractor used inferior grade concrete in the foundation of the home. What are his options? 
Assuming the specs were clear as to the type of concrete required for the foundation, this is a breach of contract, and the owner is entitled to any damages resulting from the breach. But is the owner entitled to suspend his performance under the contract, and assuming the contractor does not cure the defect, terminate the contract? Unlike simply using the wrong color paint, the contractor's breach in this hypothetical could potentially undermine the structural integrity of the home. In such a case, it is much more likely that a court will consider the breach to be material under Section 241 of the Restatement. A defective foundation that potentially makes a home uninhabitable goes to the very heart of the contract and undermines the basic expectation of the owner in entering into a construction contract. Accordingly, under the rules we have explored, the owner will be entitled to suspend his future payment obligation, and assuming the contractor does not cure his failure, the owner can terminate the contract.